So the first part of this presentation is actually a little bit of a replay of a presentation that Marley and Charlotte did earlier this year. And I guess before I start playing that, maybe if Marley and Charlotte, you would like to introduce yourselves. So hi, everyone. Um, yes, so I'm Charlotte. I'm a research fellow with Project Air Strategy. And um, I'm a psychologist and also a researcher where we look into trying to understand what happens in the brain um, when people feel certain things, when people think about themselves, when people try to connect with others. Um, and uh, we hope that can give a, um, a helpful perspective on what might be going on for a person with uh, BPD. Um, and so I'm happy to be here today and uh, discuss, um, well, I guess what we found so far and what others have found so far. And I hope that may be helpful to you. Mali? Hello, I'm Mali. Um, I am a registered and practicing art psychotherapist, as well as a person with lived experience of BPD. Um, and I've been working with Project Dare for about five years now, and I work in uh, that space at the moment as a lived experience consultant um, and work with them on research projects. So Charlotte and I um, have been involved in some research projects together and so have Carlin and I um, in the past. Um, and so I work closely with that organization as well. And I did my clinical practice placement with them um, whenever that was. <laughs> I have no concept of time. Last um, year. So last year. Thank you, Rita, who knows my life better than me. Um, uh, yeah, so currently I run private practice called Living Arts Therapy, where I run DBT skills. I am a qualified accredited DBT trainer through Behaviour Tech, um, and I run an arts-based DBT program and also do individual sessions. And my specialty is working with people with BPD, complex trauma, and dissociative disorders. Um, so that's kind of where I specialise in working. So, yeah, that's me. Okay, thanks, Molly. So now I'll um, share my screen and we'll view the presentation. We are Molly and Charlotte, and we work together at Project Air Strategy, and we both have a, a shared interest in understanding how our sense of self works and how we can better understand it so that we can work with people with a diagnosis of borderline personality disorder. We started talking uh, during my PhD and continued on our conversations into Mali's master's degree. And we both really appreciate um, how we can talk together and um, found a shared um, importance in the narrative therapy and the way we can talk about uh, BPD. Um, we like to work together in a team and um, our different spaces bring us together and bring together all that what we think the best of psychology, neurobiology, research, lived experience, peer support and art therapy have to offer. Today we want to just be clear that our presentation may contain imagery, language and narratives surrounding trauma, brain injury, stigma, medical treatments and emotional distress that some might find confronting. We encourage you to please use skills and strategies available to you to practice self-care and self-protection, especially if you are also a beautiful, highly sensitive human being. And we'd like to think about the role uh, of this presentation in raising awareness around borderline personality disorder and understanding um, what it's like to live with a borderline personality disorder. And we think language is a very important role in understanding it and talking with each other about it. A lot of the language is unfortunately also unhelpful and is depicted here on the left, uh, such as attention seeking or manipulative, and doesn't really represent what the people with lived experience or the carers are actually experiencing. And so there was also other language suggested that can be more helpful and connecting where we try to understand what's going on for the person and understand that they are doing the best in the situation that they are in. 
And today we also hope to offer a bridge of understanding um, borderline personality disorder, not as, I guess, black and white as it is depicted here, but in all its colors um, and the, with the different experiences. And um, by telling you about lived experience and also neuroimaging findings, we hope that we can build this bridge between understanding what might be going on for the person and then also uh, thereby hopefully reducing stigma and finding better ways of supporting each other. Let's start with understanding how we see the development of personality disorder. And we would like to use this biopsychosocial model of Project AIR, where we see a role for uh, genetic inheritance and for environmental factors that come together in the development of personality disorder. And research tells us it's kind of like a 50-50 distribution. Uh, both play a role. And what we can understand as biological factors, what we can maybe see is that kids are born differently. Some have, they are different temperaments and some kids may be more sensitive to their environment and respond more to their environment, whereas other kids or infants don't or not as much. And then there is the environment, the psychosocial factors that play a role, um, whether people or caregivers are around the person to help them uh, co-regulate what's going on for them, to build that attachment and to help them develop a personality um, and to be able to learn how to build relationships in life. And when these two things uh, come into a mix where things don't work so well, uh, we can have, we can observe difficulties in three core mechanisms. One is around effect in um, the experience of emotions and the regulation of them. One is around identity in building that sense of self and uh, in relationships and understanding what's going on for others and being able to build those relationships. And what that may look like in the room, how people may present uh, their symptoms. Um, can be different uh, and can include cognitive symptoms like thinking around, thinking uh, there's no, no future, uh, feeling hopeless um, and dissociation of disconnecting from reality or from the world out there. Um, it can be emotional around experiencing intense shame or anger or behavioral where we can see people um, managing their inner world with self-harm or with impulsive actions. So um, then we can maybe understand how from early on, people may have been more sensitive in their genes or in their environment. And as time goes on, um, can be developed into a personality disorder that we can see in late adolescence or early adulthood. I am an art psychotherapist, but before that, I was a person with lived experience and I am a person with lived experience. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my story and weave my story through the narrative of all this important research. So the story of my brain begins in utero. I was born premature and unwell and grew up in an environment that was unsafe, unstable traumatic and prevented my brain from getting the things she needed to, to thrive. I was often labeled the bad kid, the naughty kid, the problem child. I had both biological and environmental links to poor mental health. And that meant my brain often operated in survival mode from a very young age. This meant that my brain created its blueprint within low socioeconomic areas that had poor access to health, educational and social services, and no access to mental health care at all. My environment was full of people with undiagnosed and untreated mental health issues, trauma, violence, substance abuse, and poor parental care. Many of my playmates also experienced severe abuse and neglect, and these things were normalized and acceptable. We are the children that I hear many people describe as falling through the cracks, when in actual fact, we live in a giant ravine. Services only came in when absolutely necessary and they did the absolute bare minimum. They often made my situations worse, inciting fear and punishment in a community that responded with violence 
and resource hoarding towards its most vulnerable people. It was a perfect environment for BPD to grow. And I think that's important to realize how trauma and adverse childhood experiences are so impactful and are, of course, a risk factor for psychological disorders later in life, not only borderline personality disorder, but also other disorders. And in that respect, we also want to understand or acknowledge that this association between trauma and borderline personality disorder is a complex one. Um, not everyone that experiences this trauma develops BPD, um, but also not everyone with BPD has experienced trauma. And so we would like to highlight that we all have a unique genetic environmental profile that makes us who we are. What we'd like to highlight though is that the way we've come to be today is not uh, necessarily determining our future path. Our genes are more malleable and our brain is more plastic than we maybe once thought. And maybe we can rethink this genetic vulnerability for what happens to us into a sensitivity. Some people may be more sensitive to what happens in their environment, but that includes not only negative, but also positive events. So if we can provide people with more positive experiences um, and different uh, experiences of different ways or better ways of relating, um, then we can also change um, the way we do things. So that our genetic expression or in our brain can adapt to these new positive experiences. We human beings are a social kind and our brain is really wired to learn socially. We learn from others around how the world works and how others see us and how you interact with the world. And that's also uh, visi strongly visible in our brain when we, for example, look at how the brain thinks about ourselves is very similar to how we think about others. It's also clear in the way um, we know how attachment is important. Um, for babies when they're born, they need others to meet their physical and emotional needs to be able to look after, be looked after and cared for. But also later in life, when, for example, um, we, we learn to regulate our emotions, perhaps to some degree by ourselves, um, but we also still involve others. Um, also, when we are having a hard time, we like to ring up someone and talk it through. Um, so other people are always important for us. The first topic that we will look into is affect. And here we can look into how um, emotion regulation and emotion processing may be challenging for people with BPD. How we understand the difficulties that they may experience is, is um, that we observe a heightened emotional sensitivity and a difficulty to regulate these intense emotional responses that they may experience and then also a slow return to emotional baseline um, so these emotions stay strong and high for a longer time and again we understand that these difficulties with regulating emotions come from these early sensitivities um, and uh, specific environmental influences such as invalidation so we'll here look into two key domains the experience of emotion and also the regulation of emotions. So my emotions have always been incredibly intense and they drove my actions and my behaviours. In the place I grew up, the threats around me were very, very real and I needed to be on high alert a lot. So if we look at where when resources in your space are low, so when we don't have those people to call, for example, being aware of emotional responses are key to survival. These are high risk, high impact environments where logic is a luxury that you can't always afford and don't have time for. Those around me also operated in this way and it created chaos. My brain became used to threat seeking, having to problem solve quickly and expertly without a lot of options. It had to protect itself and meet my most basic needs of simply staying alive. Things changed a lot for me when at the age of 28, I suffered a surprise stroke. An MRI of my brain showed four separate injuries that had been undiscovered for years, which prompted me to finally begin to understand that my brain was different. 
So it wasn't a psychologist who spoke to me about the neurology of my brain. It was a neurologist. These injuries that I have are located in my vertebral artery, frontal lobe, and trigeminal nerve. So this began a cycle of questioning. How do I understand myself now through the lens of brain injury, trauma, and mental illness? What is affecting what? What is responsible for what? These questions are still largely unanswered, but I find the research that we do um, and Charlotte and uh, her colleagues are doing helpful to try to understand my stories. In thinking about the brain and how it works and which areas are important for what, I guess I would like to acknowledge that in a way um, we still have a limited understanding of what happens we know that the brain is a complex network of interacting areas that together can do certain, certain things like make us self-aware, make us able to think about what others might be thinking. But these are very complex functions, say. So uh, we highlight some areas that we think are important and that um, we know from research indicates are important for BPD. Um, but we also would like to say that the research is still developing and that our understanding may change over time. So for processing emotions in the brain, I would like to first in general tell that these areas are relevant. So we have uh, the limbic system that includes the amygdala um, that kind of indicates the saliency of an event. Is this important for us, what's going on? And gives us a sense of arousal in our bodies. And then we have somatosensory and motor areas like the precentral and the postcentral gyrus that are in the, in the insula that make us, um, that gives, give our bodily sensations and experiences um, that are associated with these emotions. And then we also have midline regions um, that help to generate this self-awareness that this is what I'm experiencing right now. And um, in the area of emotion processing, this is, I think, where we have most evidence around how that might work for people with BPD in their brains. Um, so here we have an overview of 52 studies that looked into different emotion tasks where people were experiencing emotions and um, looked at how people with a diagnosis of borderline personality disorder uh, experienced this or did this and how their brain responded in comparison to non-clinical control subjects. And we could see that the amygdala here um, was more responsive um, to these tasks. So there was a greater amygdala response. And we've also seen in the research that the amygdala is not only more active or more responsive, but often also smaller in size. Um, and interestingly, other related research has seen that this hyperreactivity of the amygdala is also linked to childhood maltreatment and particularly emotional maltreatment. So the first part of my brain that I want to share with you is amygdala. She is a protector, but her methods are sometimes extreme and uncompromising. Like Charlotte says, she is tiny, but she is fierce. She is tough and untrusting. She learned how to behave from her experiences. She has survived and seen some seriously scary and violent things, and she will never forget them. She's a threat seeker who can find danger in everyone and everything, including herself. When she was scared or hurt, which was often, she didn't know how to express this properly and had been taught that fear and hurt were weakness. They were responded to with ridicule, invalidation, punishment and violence. So she mirrored what she saw around her, becoming violent, ruthless and unkind herself. She learned to never hesitate to attack and she became the threat. Amygdala and I didn't really communicate and she was often in control. She would lash out preemptively to people who tried to help or contain her and then I would feel shame and sadness. Her reaction to this was anger and rage pointed both outward and inward, resulting in crushing isolation. 
she often locked me away, believing it was in my best interest. Her entire goal is to keep me safe and hurt alive, but her behavior caused turmoil and havoc in my life. In truth, I was terrified of her and she became the part of myself I hated the most. It took me a long time to settle amygdala enough so I could see her true purpose. She's a brilliant actress. She will show you bravery, courage, toughness, intelligence, and confidence. In reality, she's a very scared little girl who is trying at every moment to escape threats and pains that are very real to her. You need to remember, most of the bad things that amygdala thinks might happen to her have happened to her. These threats that doctors, psychologists, and psychiatrists think are irrational or perceived actually existed in her world. Amygda never learned to soothe herself in helpful ways. So she used things like self-injury, drugs and alcohol, and dissociative states. These things create more danger, but for her, they were consistent and also highly linked to chemical responses in the brain. I had to teach her to find other ways to self-soothe, but this is still difficult. Her emotions are still just as strong, but we understand now that they might not need an action anymore. She hates surprises and she needs control. So color helped us sort out the emotions and start to label them. Color, shape and line helped us communicate to others what we didn't have words to say. And our color language is our strongest dialect. We knew that colors often sat alongside of each other. Some of them combined to make huge emotions like hurt, fear, and frustration make up anger the way pink and blue make purple. The more I practiced talking with amygdala in color, the better she got at communicating. Repetitive movement also makes her feel very safe. Sometimes people refer to this as stimming. And so we learned to draw circles and lines instead of fight and run and hurt ourselves and others. She also learned narrative therapy techniques that helped us to paint out our anger and rip up and burn paper instead of ourselves, to write pages about her feelings instead of punching walls. I learned what amygdala needed to feel safe and we spent time with things like our favorite trees who had mothered amygdala when she was trying to hold too much inside. We practiced asking Mother Ocean to hold our big feelings and keep them safe for us. And then we learned how to be our own ocean, how to tread water, ride the waves and survive storms safely. When communicating with amygdala, you need to be careful. She needs a safe space to be heard that is completely non-judgmental. She will retreat quickly and completely if you come too close, too fast. Safety is key and creating safer spaces needs to be a priority. Clinical spaces were most often traumatic and confronting for me. And so I am very lucky to have a psychologist who can lean into my safe relationships with trees and is open to sitting in a park each week doing therapy so I can feel held by her and the gum trees as well. In this way, I welcome her into my world and she is able to become a part of my chosen safe space. My amygdala has grown up a lot in the last decade and she can now tell you what she's feeling and she allows the gentle, kind and soft emotions in her world more. She also lets them speak and spend time with other people as well. And she's reframed some of her threat responses. She's still super savvy and very street smart, but now she takes the time to step back when something gets her attention or activates her. She checks the facts, weighs up real risks, and is most often in wise mind. When working with these intense emotional responses, please do not invalidate them with facts straight away. The feelings that pump through our systems are felt in real ways. They exist and they're intensely painful. This might mean that you have to sit through times where you can't see the logic in them, 
that's absolutely okay. But practice teaching us to survive these feelings with active skills. Don't act like they are fictitious or irrational or wrong. Be a safe space for them to be felt. Comfort always comes first. Solutions next. And just like we need other people to help us regulate emotions or learn us about that, the amygdala also need other areas in the brain to help regulate the emotions. And a lot of them are in the frontal area um, to help understand uh, what's going on, um, attributing mental states to others um, and um, making choices around uh, what would be helpful. So when we look into emotion regulation, we see it as a, a deliberate way of changing one's emotions to be more in line with what you want to achieve or what you need at that time. And a common form in which we study emotion regulation is cognitive reappraisal, where we ask people to take some distance from the emotional experience or to reinterpret the situation, like such as when life gives you lemons, you make lemonade. Um, and when we look into how that may differ in people with BPD in the way that their brain responds, um, we do must say that findings are still inconsistent. Um, and I guess that is also to do with the way we try to measure this. But there is some inconsistent findings in these areas in the midline regions, the anterior cingulate cortex and the posterior cingulate cortex are, are important um, where we see and where we see differences in the regulation of emotions. So for people with BPD, um, it's often that this area is not as active. And it's interesting that this is seen not only in the down regulation of emotions. So when you want to maybe lessen an intense feeling, but also in the upregulation. So if you try for someone to increase a certain feeling, so to actively change your feeling is a very uh, challenging task. And we can see that reflected in these areas in the brain. Um, it's also interesting that these areas, uh, for example, the ACC is also important in um, relational domains. So for example, when we interact with others and to understand whether we may be rejected or not. And the PCC is also um, important in the area of thinking about the self, in being self-aware and to reflect on the self. So these, this need for emotion regulation um, may also be related to the interpersonal stressors that people are experiencing in their relationships and the difficulties with reflecting on the self or um, understanding what's going on within the self. Thank you, Marley and Charlotte. And now um, <clears throat> Marley and Charlotte are going to do a, a short presentation and Marley will do a couple of, of drawing activities. And I think Charlotte's going to be speaking to the amygdala, is that correct, Marley? Yep. Hi, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you. I guess this is a bit of a summary of what we just uh, saw in the presentation that Mali and I did. And um, yeah, just like to say again, um, Mali has made these uh, great infographics and there's a few more that I think we'll uh, share. Um, but in this presentation, we're focusing on the amygdala and uh, it's the role that it plays in being able to feel emotions, but also to see emotions and understand emotions in other people. And um, so the amygdala is very helpful in um, looking around and seeing what other people might be um, uh, uh, saying or um, thinking um, and to see if there's any threat there. Um, and thereby can maybe tell us whether it's important now to maybe feel scared or anxious or um, or even shameful or guilty. Um, 
And like we said in the presentation, uh, for those with BPD, the amygdala is often found to be smaller and also more reactive. So it has like more stronger uh, responses to seeing emotions in other people. And that might be a feeling of threat or um, anxiety there. Um, and so um, as Mali describes so beautifully, uh, her amygdala can have difficulty with checking the facts and um, uh, with knowing after having, uh, having had many experiences where they needed to be on guard, um, it might be difficult to know now uh, whether um, you need to be on guard or not. So it might give you a, a warning sign uh, sooner, uh, even when there might not be a threat out there. Um, so it helps to help the amygdala to feel safe and soothed. And um, I think Mali will take us through some exercises in which we can do this through art therapy um, exercises. Uh, but there's, I guess, other ways that you can do this too when people do, for example, mindfulness exercises or breathing. Um, yeah, so ways that we can calm our amygdala. Um, I think over to you, Mali. Um, I can only see Charlotte on my screen at the moment. Um, but Rita, if you could flick the slide over, that would be really helpful. So I talked a little bit about um, repetitive uh, movement or repetitive line in the presentation that we did. Um, and repetitive artwork is one of the best ways that we found to regulate the emotional system. So much like Charlotte was talking about with the amygdala, one of the things that's interesting is that we know that often, especially with people with BPD, that the emotion lands before sometimes the conscious thought lands. So our bodies are geared to feel things before perhaps the logic kind of switches on and we understand it. So if you think about uh, conversations that people have about, um, you know, the way that trauma enters the body and things like that, we know that often people start to perhaps feel the symptoms of anxiety before they realize what they're anxious about. And I think this goes to what Charlotte has um talked about about the amygdala being quite overactive in that it doesn't take much for it to kind of be triggered it doesn't take much for that fear response to kind of settle in so often we experience that as a feeling in our body before it's a conscious thought so repetitive artwork or any form of repetitive movement is a self-soothing to our brain and if you think about it I like to kind of reminds myself that it's the reason why people rock babies, right, is to kind of get that repetitive kind of movement going. Now, if we've grown up and we weren't a person who was rocked as a baby or wasn't taught how to self-soothe, then we don't have an understanding of how to do that. And so it can not be inherent. It cannot be something that we know how to do automatically. And so we have to recreate that. So this is where the behavior of stimming often comes in. And if you haven't heard of, of the word stimming, it comes from largely the big, beautiful, diverse, neurodiverse community use this word a lot. And often you'll see it in um, things like rocking, using fidget spinners, um, any type of movement that is done over and over again. And so we can replicate this by using um, art practice and you will probably find that whether or not you have a diagnosis of any mental health issue at all, you probably stim, even though you might not realize it, or you might not call it that, or you might not, um, I guess, be aware of it. So using repetitive line is a really good way to actively engage this type of self-soothing behavior, where we have to actually put it in place very consciously ourselves, where it's not an unconscious or automatic behavior. Um, so there's lots of ways that we do this in art practice. So one of the key ways that we kind of encourage people to do it is to just start with some simple lines and just draw patterns on pages to start with a central shape and outline it. You can do this via creating a work using simple brush strokes, outlining colors with an existing artwork, or if you are not really kind of like a 
a visual artist kind of person. You can also do this in other ways, such as outlining letters or words in a document. So this is where you might get an old book and literally go through and circle all of the letter T. Or you might circle all of the letter um, S. Or you might circle the word the, for example. What happens is that we find that what the brain feels safe in the predictability of that. So it knows exactly what the task is that it needs to do and it can relax. And it allows that emotion response, that deactivation that Charlotte was talking about to come down. So a lot of distress tolerance is simply about providing us some space and time for our emotional system, our amygdala say, um, to actually settle so that we can get to the point where we've got that ability to check the facts. We've got that ability for the logic system in the brain to come on. And we're giving ourselves space from being able to be responsive to the real environment versus being reactive to a perceived threat that's caused by um, some dysregulation in um, the amygdala. Other things that you can do, and of course, this has become quite popular, although I will have to say that there's actually no scientific evidence that this works. Coloring in, I know that there's a lot of like mindfulness adult coloring in books and stuff out there. There isn't a lot of um, actual scientific evidence to show that it's helpful, but a lot of people do find it helpful. Um, some people find it really uncomfortable as well. So once again, it's about what works for you. Mixing paint is something that um, people find uh, soothing at time and if you think about like the stirring of paint if you think about that repetitive movement that like kind of this kind of vibe that um, makes a lot of sense kneading clay or dough play-doh playing with something that's malleable um, is also really soothing to some people's brains um, a note that it can also be very triggering for people that have specific trauma so we need to be mindful of that and there's growing evidence that um, things like stitching, hand stitching, crochet, knit and weaving, anything where our hands are once again doing these types of movements is really, really soothing to our brain and our brain kind of loves that. So there's a lot of other activities outside of our practice that are repetitive movement that we might not realize. So of course we've got fidget spinners. They've become unbelievably popular um, you know, these days. But what people don't realize is that they can also engage in, in repetitive soothing or self-soothing by things like watching a TV show or a movie that you've seen over and over again. And this is once again, because we know what's going to happen. We know what the characters are going to do. We're not, there's not going to be any jump scares. There's not going to be, you know, you know, some kind of terrible monster jump out at us unless of course we're watching a tv show that's got that in it but watching something that is familiar to you is a soothing activity and our brain understands that and can help de-escalate it's often why people do things like reread books for example um, some of the other things that we can do is things like driving a familiar positive route so um, you know if you've got like a particular drive that you do um, maybe down a coastal road or something um, if you're feeling particularly activated, then you can always jump in the car and do that. And once again, it's kind of about going down a familiar path and allowing the brain to sit in that safe space of understanding um, its environment and not having to be so reactive to that environment. So that is a bit of an overview about the different ways that you can bring um, repetitive movement and that kind of self-soothing into a more conscious practice of actually sitting down, for example, and making a decision to engage in that type of practice. We're going to do an activity, and I think that um, our reader sent um, out some information for you, so I hope that people actually do have access to some maybe art materials, all you need is literally a piece of paper and a pen to do this activity. We're going to do an activity called a Zentangle. Um, Rita, could you flip over? Okay, so this is a Zentangle. This is something that is well known to a lot of people and it is a beautiful regulation task. It serves two functions. 
So first, of course, it embeds the idea of repetitive movement because we often integrate patterning into a Zen Tangle. But one of the things that a Zen Tangle also does is it also helps trigger the reward system in your brain. So we've talked a lot about like the amygdala and the kind of limbic system and things like that, the emotion system. But what we haven't touched on is that it's also really key for our reward feeding function. So we do something, we accomplish that thing. And when we get a kick of um, often like dopamine or serotonin, so all of these good chemicals. So it's important when we focus on these brain systems to not just like focus on maybe what's not working so well with them, but also what actually we can do to help them function better. They have a function, their function's not just to terrify us. Um, and so looking at how we can trigger the reward system in our brain is really helpful as well. So once again, much like with the amygdala, what we need to do is we need to create very small tasks that are incredibly achievable. So we have to give ourselves every opportunity to win. Um, and so we can do that by really drawing down what we're going to do. So hopefully you've got a pen and a piece of paper you were also sent, um, I think, a template. Were they sent the template, I think? No. Okay, then I won't talk about the template. Um, we will send you a template after this um, that gives you a step-by-step -step instruction about how to do a Zentangle. But um, I'm going to see whether or not you want to come along and do one with me now. So I have a camera here, by the way, that's showing you my um, workspace. You can watch what I'm doing. It's here. My hands are like doing this dance under it here. Hopefully you can see it. Um, I'm sorry if you can't. So one of the things that we're going to do is when we do a Zentangle, we do it in a very measured way. So we do one thing at a time. This is a task that we use predominantly when we're in quite high distress. So that means that we have to acknowledge that our brain doesn't have the resources that it does when it's not in that state. Our brain is often in survival mode. So one thing at a time is really, really important. So I'm going to encourage you to draw on your piece of paper nine dots anywhere on the page, just nine dots. They can be as big or as small as you want them to be, but just nine dots. They can look exactly however you want them to be. And if you're bad like me, you're probably going to have to count it over and over again because I'm terrible at counting things. So nine dots. So that's the first task. So if you've achieved that, winning. That's great. Nine dots on a page. Love that. The next thing that we're going to do is once we've got our nine dots is we are going to join these dots with lines and you can use any type of line you want, be as creative as you possibly want. So as long as they're touching, it doesn't matter what the line looks like, just have fun with it. Just do a continuous line that's got all of those nine dots joined somehow. It's up to you how you do it. And once you're done, be done. So that is the next step. So once you've done that, congratulations, you've achieved that as well. What's happening in the brain at the moment is the brain is going, I have a task, I achieve it, I get a reward. Even if you don't feel it, it might not be super automatic at the moment or you might not experience it. It's starting to get your brain into a pattern of going, I do something, I can achieve it and I can be rewarded for that. So it's starting to kind of regulate that a little bit. Um, of us being able to kind of have a goal and achieve it very, very quickly. Now, what then happens is that you're left with all of these lovely little sections. And so what we do is we do one thing at a time. We take each of the sections and literally just start to fill them with patterning. So once again, this is now integrating not only this kind of reward function of going, I can achieve one section at a time, but also brings into it repetitive movement. So you've got a soothing thing happening where you're engaging with repetitive movement over and over again, which the brain really loves. And you're combining it with achieving something, with being able to say, 
my goal or my task was simply to just fill in that section. And so as you're going and you do each section and you need to do each section as you go. Don't start with one section and do like a couple of lines and then jump to another section. That's not going to be helpful for the brain. We're going to just kind of keep going and achieve that section filled with either line or color. If you start to notice when you're doing it that you're becoming really fixated on things like the lines needing to be perfect, right, or the patterning needing to be beautiful or something, this is really, really good to know. All this means is that your amygdala is just a little bit more attuned. So it's really good to know that because what we can do then is we can respond to that. And we always respond to those types of things with love and kindness and self-compassion. So then we might say, all right, if the patterning is getting me stuck, if I'm starting to feel bad about myself because I can't get the pattern right, then we switch. So that might mean, could you instead switch to using color? So could you instead switch the task from I'm going to draw lines to literally be like, I'm just going to color in the section. Then I'm going to get another color and I'm going to color in another section. And so therefore what we can do is we can remove the barrier. If the line and the patterning is a barrier for you, then just be kind and gentle with that, accept that and see if you can take out that barrier to this being something that might be helpful. Now, the goal of course, is to continue to do this until you finish. Each time you finish a section, you're going to get a little bit of a positive reward in your brain. But the ultimate reward of course, is to finish the entire thing. So I always encourage people when they're in spaces to do a Zen tangle that they think that they can accomplish within the time that they've got together. So I think we've got about another, what, 30 minutes of this session. So hopefully that means that you will be able to continue on doing your Zen tangle as we go into a bit of a Q&A. So um, Hopefully you'll be able to continue on with doing the Zen tangle in this way. So once again, if we come up to those kind of barriers with this, where we start to notice the perfectionism, just notice it, just notice it and have a conversation with it. One of the things that I often like to remind people is that with these types of processes, they're just about the process. The product doesn't matter so much. So we can actually make a conscious decision to let it go. So even before I start, I can tell myself, I'm going to throw this away. It's the process of actually going through the regulation process and allowing the emotions to settle that actually is the outcome we want. What it looks like isn't actually so important in the long run. Sometimes we get a call cool effect that we want to keep around. Other times it might not be something we're going to hang on our wall. That's fine. The process is more important than the product. One thing I often ask people as well to do is come into these types of tasks with curiosity. So can we be curious about what it's going to look like instead of being tied to a specific result? Can we be joyful and playful with it? Can we kind of go into it with, um, I guess, the, the kind of hope or the optimism of, of a child who is just interested in what it's going to look like in the end um, and not be so uh, critical or self-judgmental of it. Um, and so that is a Zen tangle. So I, I will send you this, actually, this little template that I have together. So these can be really, really good if you use Zen tangles um, when you're in really high distress. So for example, they can be very helpful when we're in panic attacks and things like that. Um, doing something like this where once again, the brain doesn't have to remember things because it's in survival mode and it's doing everything it can to try to keep you safe in that moment. Some Having like things like this that are around can be really helpful because you've got the instructions there in front of you and you've also got those nine dots placed in a way to start if you want. Um, 
often I will have lots of Zentangles around my house in different states of completion. Um, and that kind of helps me pull them out depending on where I'm at. So I might leave this one. And if I'm in a space where I'm really highly distressed and I can't even get to the point of getting to this point, then I can pull this out and just keep going with it. Um, so it's already there for me. It's kind of like ready and prepared for me to come on board when I need it. So that is a Zentangle. Um, I want to talk to you about one more um, art practice and process that we can use to regulate the um, amygdala or the limbic system um, before we go into a Q&A. But please continue on to do your Zentangle. I don't want to stop you doing that. Um, and that is called continuous line. Now, continuous line is highly underrated as a process to regulate our system. Um, often people like to refer to continuous line as doodling, which I find actually offensive because um, it is a high level neurobiological skill and that's how we should see it. So for example, many of us do this. We might scribble on a piece of paper when, when we're on the phone or in a meeting. Um, and what's important about it is that if we can actually see that what's actually happening is that this is our brain's attempt to regulate itself, then we can start to view that process and practice as a skill. And this is really important. When we can identify what's going on and say, okay, look how smart my brain is, that it's actually decided to kind of start doing the scribble thing, then we can actually reach for that really consciously in times when we need it. Or we can direct the people we're working with to reach for this in times that you're needed. So if you are a clinician in our space, one of the things that I would ask you is that if you deal with highly dysregulated clients in your space, do you have a pen and a piece of paper available for them? And can you help them regulate their emotions by doing this when they're in therapy with you? I can't remember the last time I saw my psychologist and I wasn't doing some form of repetitive line drawing. And it makes our, our sessions so much more tolerable for me. And it makes us so much more able to work through things because I'm actively regulating my system instead of just sitting there and not having anything to do with all of that emotion and all of that anxiety. So continuous line or what's often referred to as doodling or just scribbling um, can be something that you might um, encourage people to do. We know that it takes around five minutes for this progress pro process to start to regulate the brain depending on the level of dysregulation. So there is some uh, research that's been done on this in the kind of art psychotherapy space. And we know that um, it does take around five minutes before we start to see that deactivation. Um, and once again, you do need to be mindful of perfectionism and resistance at the beginning, which is why we encourage people to just do it as a scribble when they first start. But there's also the option, of course, to actually draw an, an image in a continuous line where we don't lift up the pen. But if that's not uh, a comfortable place to start, then we can just start with continuous scribbling. So the only rule with continuous line is that we don't lift the pen off the piece of paper. That is the challenge for the brain. The brain um, kind of is like, oh, I have to learn something new and this is a bit hard. And that distracts it from the emotions that it's feeling. And so we want to distract it. Um, some of you might have heard of this um, concept referred to as bilateral drawing. Bilateral drawing is where you use two hands at the same time to do this process. Um, and I do just want to put in a caveat that um, bilateral drawing is highly connected to trauma processing. And so we know that it actually can elicit um, some uh, kind of trauma responses in a positive way. It's a cathartic process, but it does need to be done um, in ways that are practiced safely. So just be mindful of doing that, that it does engage the brain in a different way um, that they're not really sure about. Um, you can also practice continuous line by coloring in, but really hyper -focus, focusing on coloring in, but actually not lifting the pen up as you're coloring in. So any type of like this type of movement really. And so that is a few different processes that you might wanna think about doing to help regulate your emotions or to help you support other people in your spaces to regulate their emotions. So yeah, that's it.
I hope you've all done. It's so weird for me not to be able to see because often when I do this, of course, I'm watching people do their zentangles in front of me. So it's incredibly annoying not to be able to see all of your beautiful zentangles. Um, but hopefully that worked. Thank you. Thank you very much for holding them up. I really do appreciate it. I love well, it. thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Molly. Yep. Thank you. I'm an art therapist, so it's, that's like, you know, it's drugs to me to see people do that. Like, so thank you. And, uh, yeah, I guess congratulations to to everyone who's um, given it a go. Yeah, thank yep. you. Um, there's only really been one comment so far in the chat, and I'll just, I'm not too sure whether people have got any questions or we're too busy drawing. Um, one person commented how she loves Zentangles now that she's been taught about them. Yep. And also a, a thank, thank you from Louisa. So are there, are there any questions for Molly or for Charlotte? Um, Molly, there's, there's one question here about in the continuous line, why is it important not to lift the pen? Um, I think actually maybe maybe um, Charlotte could answer that as well. I think my understanding is that what it is, it's about creating a, a challenge for the brain, which distracts the amygdala or um, distracts the other parts of the brain. Um, and that's kind of what it's about. So it's about kind of sitting in the um, often, like we'll just name it, the annoyance of that. Um, and you then become so annoyed by that that your distress stops. <laughs> so um that's kind of the distracting i think um component of not lifting the pen up is um is that as well often when you first start doing it as well um your hand starts to ache and i think it's a little bit of that kind of thing that like we learn right about kind of like you know if your back hurts then stub your toe and then you'll stop thinking about your back so i think it's probably a process of just rerouting the brain from what it's um fixating on a little bit but um i don't know charlotte what do you what do you think about that yeah i guess it seems like um trying to keep your attention with that part of the task and i guess not lifting the pen like you say can be the challenge of keeping your attention there um yeah i guess it could be similar to like a mindfulness exercise where your attention might drift away and might go back to the emotions or worries or things that were on your mind but to then gently ask yourself to come back to the task or the thing that you were doing. And I guess this continuous line helps to keep that focus on this one task that you're doing. Thanks, Charlotte. Uh, there's also a question here about trust issues with BPD. And my thought is that Marley and Charlotte, that this is actually a different part of the brain to the amygdala, which you haven't covered tonight. Yeah, exactly. In the broader presentation, we were also going into difficulties in um, relating to other people or understanding other people. And there's been starting to, yeah, there's starting to be some research more around the experience of trust um, and that there um, can be some differences in how people with BPD um, experience trust. Uh, it can be harder to trust certain people or certain faces, like certain expressions. Um, um, I guess there's not, yeah, th it's, it's really only starting, so I'm, I'm not too sure. I can't give a full um, uh, overview. There's like, on the one hand, there's more difficulty trusting. And on the other hand, there also seems to be a different way of relating where it's more like, um, almost like bodily instead of like uh, cognitively. Uh, understanding what's going on it's more like intuitively making sense of someone but also maybe intuitively feeling that you can't trust someone um, instead of and um, and less having that maybe cognitive um, reflection about it um, yeah I th I'm, uh, one of the um, in the infographics that uh, Mali made one is also around this area in the brain uh, the TPJ uh, which is important for taking perspective. So like uh, seeing what might be going on for other people or also looking at yourself. Um, and uh, that is kind of like, um, um, well, I guess uh, differently synced uh, in, in people with BPD. 
so it might be harder to connect to people that do not have a diagnosis of BPD. Um, and um, it would be interesting to, but this, yeah, it would be interesting to see what it's like for people with BPD connecting with each other. There might be a really good connection there. Um, and we also do see that um, when people uh, kind of recover or have uh, fewer symptoms of BPD, um, then this uh, area um, um, operates in a similar way as people that do not have a diagnosis. So that it kind of like uh, can connect uh, or sync in, uh, be in sync with other people. I'm not sure, Mali, if you would like to add anything about that. Um, I think a lot of it is about, um, it depends because like, you know, there are different forms of trust and, and trust is different in different relationships. I think, um, yeah, it's hard to kind of know <laughs> what the question's related to. I think um, there are a lot of um, really good examples of how clinicians can alter their um their ability to form trusting relationships with the people that they're working with, which is something that obviously I touched on in my presentation about, for example, my psychologist being willing to change her practice. This is something that I don't understand why clinicians, and I'm going to call out, especially psychologists, are so unbelievably obsessed with. Um, clinical environments are not safe environments for most of us. Step outside of them. There is no law preventing you from doing that. So that's something that I think uh, is really important as well about looking at your environment to build trust. Um, especially if unfortunately you are, you know, located in a hospital, for example, or in a very clinical building, um, that can be really triggering for people. And so it's hard to develop trust in a place that harmed you. And that's also something that we need to start focusing on. And we also need to like look at more trauma-informed environments. And when I say trauma-informed environments, I mean actually trauma-informed environments, not we use that word, but the, the environment itself has been altered to be trauma-informed. Um, and yeah, one of the things I think in terms of trust as well is about um, learning what works for the person and not questioning that, supporting absolutely everything you can to have a person in a space. So for example, when I run groups, people are not required to do masking behavior. They don't have to sit there and look at me face to face. They don't have to make eye contact with me. They are welcome and encouraged to self-regulate, to stim in that environment, to be in that environment as they need. So I think trust is an interesting thing because it also leans into culture and um, and the ways in which we look at that. So I think asking the person how they feel safe and then adjusting our environment to give them every opportunity they can to feel safe is key. And that's gonna be different for everyone. So yeah, there's a big question. We could do mm. an entire webinar on that, right? Thanks <laughs> both of you. Um, so someone uh, has asked here, is there a, a interested in the crossover between the work being done on sensory modulation and this work. Is, is there a, a crossover? Not my vibe. Sorry, I don't know. I don't know what that means. Um, if you want to send me a study on it, I'm happy to read it. But um, I don't know what that, what sensory modulation actually means. It, it's moderating your senses in one way. Oh. Well, yeah, Small that's taste. trauma, trauma informed, that's trauma informed practice. I would say probably more than anything. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, Charlotte. Have they done any neuroimaging studies on senses in the brain? I feel like this sits more in a trauma category than it probably does. With yeah, it's not something that uh, I've looked at or closely looked into. No, I mean, yeah, there's areas in the brain that are that are also involved in you know feeling and experiencing emotions in the in the sensory areas and the motor areas but yeah i'm um not entirely sure um maybe becca wants to um explain a little bit more about um what she was hoping to find out about sure okay becca go ahead 
Um, so sensory modulation, there's a bit of work in mental health around using sensory modulation to help create calm and it uses the same sort of um, ideas, I guess, that I hear you're talking about in terms of helping to calm the amygdala. But it's talking, um, it doesn't come from that sort of arts framework and so I it, I see that looks very similar so I was just wondering if there's been any um yeah that that you've seen any work in that there's a fair bit of work in Australia around sensory modulation and its use in uh, mental health services so I, I was just um particularly you know wondering if there was any connections but yeah maybe not <laughs> My, my perception, Becca, is that they, they're different um, and it might be just different ways to be stimulating, activating the same parts of the brain. Yeah. I think for me when I work with senses, um, when I work with any type of sense um, in especially a DBT space with people, um, I think DBT can be a little bit... Um, I think DBT, DBT is not trauma informed and that's something that we have to be acknowledged and often people are forced to engage with their senses in DBT spaces and that has been unsafe. And so I think when, it, when you do any type of sensory work, it has to come with a high level of informed consent. So I think that's something that I'm really focused on. So when we do senses, because of course we do do it, it's a great way to self-soothe, but it has to be done with the person being fully aware and being able to say no. And this is really important. Yeah, the sensory modulation work is more about helping to understand your sensory pro, uh, preferences and then using those as your superpower to help manage in the world or exist in the world. So it's sort of like looking at what things um, either activate you or help you calm and then utilising those sort of strategies. So that's the sort of context. It's not about doing stuff to people. <laughs> yeah, so that sounds like DBT, I guess. DBT is, that's that's a core component of DBT is engaging with, especially with distress tolerance um, and things like that. Of course, we teach like the five senses in DBT. But um, I think one of the things that is important about that is that in learning those processes, also you run a risk of people having to sit with the activation. Um, and so, you know, if we just, I just have to, you just have to be careful with it. That's kind of all, you know, and um, and I think that care is often maybe not taken <laughs> as much as it needs to be. So whenever I do anything with the senses, it has to be absolutely informed consent, it has to be done in a trauma informed way where the person has the right to say no. Um, I don't, and, and also in a way that, especially in a group environment, if you think about using smell, as a person with a brain injury, um, smell can activate my brain and cause massive migraine. So if I was to walk into a space and there was smell in that because someone had decided that that was soothing, that could also be really harmful. Um, and so that's one thing that I love about Zoom, actually, and about doing online stuff where, when we do, this, do sensors, because it means everyone gets their own environment that they can control, which is really lovely, um, you know. And so we've got people in some of our spaces that paint with, with scent, so actually literally use essential oils to paint with. And I love that that person has the ability to do that without anyone else in their, that group being upset by that. And it's such a beautiful, beautiful thing. Um, you know, that they get to have that. And um, and they can share that with us other ways as well. They'll often tell us what the scent is. So, yeah, I think it's, um, I think there would be a lot of like neuroscience around that stuff as well, because I think smell is such a big thing in the brain, right? Like it's, we've all had that experience of a smell just like taking us back to something, whether that be positive or negative. Mm. So, yeah, sounds really cool. I'll look into it. Uh, Molly, there's a, a question here about um, how, how you, if you've got any suggestions maybe through your, your art therapy of, of supporting children that have, may have experienced some trauma. I don't work with kids. No. It, it is a flat rule for me. Um, they're, they're way too intense for me. 
Um, but uh, art therapy is a great vehicle for working with children. It is probably, you will find art therapists in Australia, very unfortunately, mostly within uh, prison systems or within uh, child protection systems. That's where they actually pay us to do our jobs the most effectively. So that's where you get most art therapy, which is really sad. Um, but um, there are lots of people who are brilliant art therapists that focus entirely on working with children. And um, of course, we are all children. And the reason why we do that is because the first language we ever learn is color, shape and line before we develop any type of language. So that's why it works so well. So um, go to Anne Zakata. Um, Anne Zakata is the regulating body for art therapists. Um, just a note that in Australia, anyone can call themselves an art therapist. So I really um, encourage you to make sure that the person has, uh, has training and qualifications um, because the term is not regulated. Um, so anyone can use that term. But if you go to the website, Anne Zakata, which is A N Z A. C -A -C -A. The chat, Molly. Thank you very much, Rita and Zakata. That will provide you a list of everybody who has um, completed qualifications up to a national standard. Um, and art therapists are, um, you can specifically search for a, um, a, an art therapist that works with children, but um, it, it ain't me, I can tell you that. Yeah. I'm not that skilled. <laughs> um, Charlotte, there's a a question um, from from someone concerned that their children may um, develop BPD. Would you like to just respond quickly to the, the genetics of, of that? Yes, I guess um, um, so far we always understand that there's like 50-50. So like the developing BPD is like part genetic, part environment. Um, and um, yeah, I guess it's good to be aware that when you, um, like, uh, yeah, um, Panya said, or other people have said that if they find out they have BPD, that they also see if they can uh, find some support for their children or find support for their parenting if they are interested in that. Um, we actually, I think last year in the, the Consumer Family and Care Day, we had a bit of a talk about it too, because it seems to be quite a taboo around being able to talk about parenting when you also have uh, mental health uh, if issues. Um, uh, so, um, but it's very important to be able to find someone uh, that you that you feel comfortable talking about this with. Um, and I, I think I see in the chat that some people have suggested some programs as well. Um, and I know Project AIR has a program as well uh, around parenting. Uh, that is also specifically uh, for people with BPD and really talking about um, how you can talk about BPD with your children, um, uh, how you can um, make the house make a safe place, um, how you can find ways to connect with your children. Um, and so I think, uh, yeah, it would be helpful to see if you can find someone that can support you with that and be able to go through a program like that with you, or if you feel like your children could use or would want to have their own support to find someone that uh, can support them in that way. Um, yeah, and there, and yeah, and I guess just to reiterate, there are resources out there. Um, uh, and yeah, see if you can find someone that you can trust to be able to talk about it. Thanks, Charlotte. So Louisa has posted a link to Sensory Modulation in Brisbane. They actually presented at our conference um, Awareness Week last year or the year before, but their presentation is available for anyone who'd like to view it on our website. Um, what is there so many questions? Um, question on memory and forgetfulness. Um, this, this person struggles and has to write everything down. Any idea whether this would be a combination of both BPD and would depression cause this or a combination of both BPD and depression? Uh, my thought is that that's a pretty tricky question to, to answer without having a, a whole lot more knowledge. Any thoughts, Marley or Charlotte? 
Um, yeah, I guess yeah, I agree. It would be hard to say something about uh, so, someone individually. Um, I just, I guess in general, we know that stress is just um, not helping our brain to process things or to remember things. Um, so um, there can be, I guess, different reasons why this forgetfulness comes about. And if you think that this is something to do with um, mental stresses, um, to maybe find a way to have time where you can maybe um, calm the brain um, and take some time to reflect or let things sink in. Yeah. I'm not sure, Mali, what you think about that. Yeah, I think there's lots of things that could be going on there, obviously, like, you know, um, everything impacts our ability to, you know, um, I guess, have high cognitive function or executive functioning. Um, there's, there can be lots of things going on there. So I would just, in, I would just kind of, yeah, leave that to go and see an expert about that. And if things persist and it's, you know, really, really impacting your functionality, then I would encourage you to, you know, actually go and see a specialist about that. Neuropsychologist maybe, or a neurologist. Definitely. Um, it's hard for me to comment because I know that my concentration issues and my focus are often connected to my brain injury. Um, and that's pretty clear cut. So, yeah. So I've just posted a, a link there to a lot of resources that Project Dare have got on their website. Um, the parents with personality disorder, families, partners, carers, and also resources for teachers and schools and students. So there's a, a vast array of resources. And I noticed that uh, people have been posting links about FATME and also COPME. Um, there's also an organisation called Emerging Minds that uh, offers support for children who have experienced trauma. The foundation has got a little booklet on its website about how to talk to a child about um, a parent who's got BPD or an adult in their life that's got BPD. And um, there's a couple of uh, presentations from parents who have got young children, uh, a parent with BPD who have got young children, and a little bit about their journey. I'd really like to say a huge thank you to Charlotte and Marley for your presentation tonight and for Carlin to be sitting through this. And, yeah, thank you, every, everyone, so much for attending. And I hope you um, have learned something from tonight, some strategies. So thank you, everybody. I hope you finished your Zantangles. Please finish them. Give your brain the best dopamine kick it can get. So even if it's five minutes after this session, spend the next five minutes finishing off your Zantangle to get the maximum effect in your brain and feel good about yourself. And thank you for showing us all of that. You accomplished that goal. So amazing. Look how amazing uh, your brains are. Beautiful. Uh, halfway there, but I've been concentrating on other things as well. Lovely. Beautiful. So, thanks so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.